When I teach, I usually or often start a class with a question. Have you ever saw, thought or said something that you immediately said, I shouldn't have said that? Okay. Have you ever thought that after a prayer? Have you ever prayed an angry prayer? Were you afraid of lightning coming down from heaven and striking you because you dared to be angry with God? I've been there. Okay. Had a family once at school, and Gladys will know this story. I won't have to tell her names. I won't tell names, but she'll know. Had a family who had a little boy born without a completely formed brain stem. He wasn't supposed to live that long. He lived till he was three, but ultimately cancer is what killed him. Not long after that, their one surviving son was diagnosed with the same cancer. I prayed an angry prayer. God, enough is enough. They've been through too much. Give them this one son they have left. And dare I say, I said the words, knock it off to God. I survived. Am I wrong to pray that? Am I wrong, dare I say, to question what God is doing? Well, I am human after all. I don't have all the answers. This made no sense to me. This didn't seem like it was part of God's bigger plan of grace for this family. Although I should say, if he's not in college right now, he'll start in the fall. I, I've lost track of exactly how old he is. But he is still alive and well. Why would I pray that? Maybe you in the same situation might pray something a little less angry. Well, part of it is we each have a different relationship with God. We're all in a different spot. Don't raise your hands for this. But have you ever looked around the church and seen somebody and said, I wish I had their walk with God? Have you ever been jealous of somebody else's faith because somehow you felt yours was lacking? I have. I was a fortunate person. I was raised by two wonderful people of faith. And I can look at them as I, grow, as, as I was growing up and I can think, gosh, why aren't I like that now the way they were when they were the same age I was or am? But we see in the Scripture different relationships. And I'm starting with a weird passage. I'll go ahead and read it off of this because I did all my study out of the NIV. And it doesn't sound like it'll make sense, but I'll do my best to make it make sense. In one of his final speeches to the people of Israel, they're about to go into the promised land. He tells the people of Israel, keep the words of this covenant to do them, that you may prosper in all you do. You stand here today, all of you, before the Lord your God, your chiefs, your tribes, your elders, your officers, even all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the alien who is within your camps, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into the covenant with the Lord your God and into his oath which the Lord your God is making with you today in order that he may establish you today as his people 
and that he may be your God just as he spoke to you and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, not with you alone am I making this covenant and this oath, but those who are uh, who stand here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God and with those who are not with us here today. We often have a community approach to our faith. And yes, this is the community of Israel who Moses is speaking to. But you notice he points out, back it up a couple of slides, Vanessa, the, the leaders... There you go. Go forward. Go now. There you go. You're... <laughs> Give me 13 and 14. Okay, no, back it up. I don't know which one I want. Okay, stop. No. <laughs> I want 9 and 10. There you go. There you go. Your chiefs, your tribes, your elders, your officers, all the men of Israel, plus your children and your wives and your slaves, you're all here to listen to this. Yes, you are here as a community, but each of you individually are responsible to keep this covenant. There are times in Scripture where the person involved is real gutsy. God tells Abraham, I'm going, to, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. What is his response? Really? You're going, to, you're going to destroy the righteous with the unrighteous? What if you find 50 people? Any of you like to make those kind of deals with your children? Well, Mom, what if I... I know you told me to clean up my room. But what if I clean it up halfway? Then... We generally don't make deals like that. But Abraham barters God down to, what was it, five? If you can just find five righteous men, God says, okay, I'll, I won't for five. Would you have wanted to do that bargaining with God? I'm seeing a couple of brave people nodding their heads. I don't, I'm not going to go there. The one that gets me is in uh, Numbers. The spies have come back from scouting out the land. You remember that story? Ten of them said, oh, actually they all agreed on the story. They're big, scary people. They all agreed that, oh, but it's a great land. Oh, it's. The difference came in, what are we going to do with it? Ken said, oh, no, we can't do it. Two, Joshua and Caleb said, let's go. And in Numbers, oh, where am I? Verse, or chapter 14, it's not on the thing, so don't go looking for it. Um, Verse 12 of Numbers 14, God says, I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you, Moses, into a great nation, greater and stronger than they. God has had enough. Moses goes, wait a minute. Then the Egyptians will hear about it. By your power, you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of, of this land about it. And if I can do George's paraphrase, he says, listen, people have already heard about your power in Egypt, and then if you're going to destroy the people of Israel now, they're going to hear about that. What are they going to think about you? And he pretty much comes out, you made a promise to this people, you need to forgive them. Anybody want to go to God with that statement? Verse 20, Lord replies, I have forgiven them as you asked. It's because Moses had the guts to call God on a promise. He says, I forgive them because you want me to.
Last fall, I taught a course at CCU in Psalms. It's like the fourth time in a row I've taught it. I keep thinking they're, they're waiting for me to get it right. We ran across a psalm that I don't know if I'd ever really paid attention to it before. I said, you don't hear many sermons on this. And one of the guys in the class says, well, I think you should. Really? I should preach a sermon on this one? Well, yeah. And his response was, surely there's a message in there somewhere. It's Psalm 109, and it's what we call an imprecatory psalm. It's where the writer of the psalm is really calling for fire, brimstone, destruction on his enemies. Not the most spiritually upright of desires. It starts with, O God whom I praise, do not remain silent. It ends with, my mouth, or with my mouth, I will greatly extol the Lord in the great throng, I will praise him. Okay, this is David, the same guy who gave us, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And many wonderful psalms. In the middle of it, he says, of his enemy, may an evil man, or appoint an evil man to oppose him. Let an accuser sta stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him be found guilty, and may his prayers condemn him. May his days be few, may another take his place of leadership. May his children be fatherless, and a wife like a widow May his children be wandering beggars. May they be driven from their homes. Wait a minute. This is David, a man after God's own heart. And he has written a very hurtful, if you will, prayer about his enemies. I wonder if God is sitting there watching him write it. David's reading it out loud. Let me see how this sounds. And he gets to the end. He goes, period. Okay, end. I'm done with it. And I wonder if God looked at David and said, you done now? You feel better? You got it out of your system now? And I wonder if David went, yeah, I feel better. Don't we sometimes just have to vent? Now let's leave God out of the equation for a little bit. Do you have that friend that you will let get away with saying most anything to you? And then when they're done, you go, you done now? You feel better? Do you have that friend that you can say anything to? that's put up with all sorts of nonsense from you. And they've stayed a faithful, true friend. And when you're being an idiot to somebody else, they'll defend you. Okay? Like, well, you know, just had a bad day. You know? I put myself on the line a couple years ago. I asked one of my classes, one of my high school classes, what's wrong with me? I don't know, Charlie, were you in that class when I asked that? Okay. What is wrong with me? And some of them just got that look like, oh, I got some suggestions, but I'm not about to say it. <laughs> and finally, somebody <clears throat> got up the courage Mr. Miller, you're just too darn blunt. Okay, what do you mean? Well, if we're being stupid, you have no trouble telling us. And this is a problem because one of the students, well, I'm okay with that. I like knowing exactly where I stand. I'm going, thank you, you get an A. <laughs> I guess I have a little bit too much of my earthly father in me because he was not exactly one to tiptoe around the truth. And I have learned as I've gotten older, it does me no good to do that. 
And I'd much rather be honest if, and if I can, gentle at the same time so that you never have to worry about where you stand with me. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go out of my way to hurt your feelings. But ladies, if you ask me what I think of your outfit <laughs> and you don't want to know the truth, forgive me if I lie. This goes mostly to my wife sitting back in the back. Okay? Unless, you, unless you're not ready for an honest answer, don't ask me the question. If you want an honest answer, you may want to get me off by myself. I feel confident that when David was writing Psalm 109, nobody was sitting over his shoulder going, Ooh, David, I don't know if you should write that or not. This was between him and God. And he gave a very honest, painfully honest description of his feelings. And we're not told who this person is. Could be Saul. Could be actually one of his own children. He didn't exactly have a happy family life. It could have been some other king. It should have been just somebody who was always a thorn in his side. We don't know, but we we do know from what he wrote, he was bothered by this. So much he said things that he probably never would have said to somebody's face. But that's the relationship he and God had. God says, okay, you're done. Yeah, I think I'm done. Okay. I'll take care of you, but I don't know that I'm going to do this. That's pretty heavy-handed. Moses and Abraham before were at least, were, were, were kind of facing up to God on behalf of somebody else. Students who've had me for a while, I can see the facial expressions, I can see the eye rolls. When a new student tries something, they go, well, you let so-and-so get away with that. I've known so-and-so since he was a third grader. I've known this person for five years. I've known this one for 10 years. I've known this one. You just got here. I don't know you. You and I have not established a relationship. You and I have not established a rapport. And at the end of the year last year, I did have a student say, you know, it got a lot better when I realized you just didn't hate me. Why would you think that? You're always correcting me and yelling at me, which doesn't mean yelling for a teenager. It just means you reminded them they weren't perfect. And I said, but I did tell you you did this right and this right and this. Yeah, that's when I realized it, it wasn't me. I said, no, it was you. You had to realize how I reacted to people. You know, Charlie's known me a long time. He knows the one thing. Don't fall asleep in my class. I'll let you, but I'll sit there with my little book and I'll keep taking points off every time I look over at you and you're still asleep. You're quite honestly less trouble that way, but... If you take the effort to at least pretend like you're paying attention, that makes our relationship better. I don't have time to worry too much about what, say, Charlie's relationship is with the other teachers in school. And I don't have a whole lot of time to worry about what your relationship with God is. I do not do New Year's resolution. That's all the TV wanted to talk about the last couple of days. What's your New Year's resolution? What? Did you just hit a record button and you just... 
Like, here's my resolution. I'm not going to make any. However, on the other side of it, isn't putting a little bit more effort into our relationship with God worth it? We have the reading schedules out there. And it's hard to read the scripture regularly, day by day, without accompanying a prayer to it. Do you want your relationship with God to be better a year from now than it is now? I hope so. Doesn't that make this a better church if we all get better at our individual relationship with God? Because when I stand at the gates of heaven, I cannot say, well, I was a member in good standing of Monument Baptist Church, Grand Junction, Colorado. How impressive is that to God? What do we actually bring to that relationship with God? I get this question a lot. Mr. Miller, why did God create us? He knew we were going to sin. He knew all this bad stuff. Why did he bother Well, if, we're, if we are created in the image of God and we are relational beings, God must also be a relational being. He needed something, someone, to have a relationship with. And again, we don't bring a whole lot to the party. What's one of the first discussions in the Bible? about the relationship between man and God. It's right after the fall. And it says, Adam and Eve hid from God as they heard him walking in the cool of the day. I don't know what that would sound like, quite honestly. But it sounds to me like this was a normal thing. Where God would come walking through the garden in the cool of the day and, hey, Adam and Eve, how's it been today? You know, name any new animals, you know. Whatever. We don't know. And God, even though he didn't have to ask, ask this question, he loves rhetorical questions, says, where are you guys? Um, we hid. Why? Well, we were kind of naked and we were embarrassed. Who told you you were naked? Um, did you eat from that tree? I told Um. And then they start pointing fingers at each other and Adam even, Adam even points it at God. Remember that? This woman that you gave me. I don't know that I'd have that guts either. <laughs> okay. See, Adam and Eve were both punished for their individual sins. They weren't punished as a couple. Okay. Moses ultimately is punished by not being allowed to go into the promised land because he disobeyed God once. And we look at that and we go, it's not that big of a deal. But what did that say about, at that moment, his priority on his relationship with God? Have you ever been to that spiritual mountaintop? It might be a retreat for the youth that are here that are going on the World Changers, it'll be that, okay? You go on World Changers, you go on a mission trip, you go any number of things, and it's a spiritual high, and then you come back to normalcy. Oh, church is so boring now compared to World Changers worship. Well, yeah, maybe so. When I was in college, we, our school was... The Baptist Student Union was a very big part of campus life. Um, and every year we'd send, oh, it seemed like 20 to 30 students out to be summer missionaries. And they'd come back in the fall talking about, oh, how close they were to God. And, you know, some even say, I finally realized I was never really a Christian, so I gave my life to God on the mission, on the mission field. And, oh, I, you know, it's, my relationship with God is so cool. And finally a friend of mine stood up and she had this really interesting tone in her voice. She goes, I'm really glad you guys had a good time this summer, but 
I just had a normal summer. And I'm glad your relationship with God is so wonderful. But mine doesn't stink just because I didn't go on a summer mission. And my mission or my relationship with God may not have been on that pinnacle of spirituality that yours was, but it is nonetheless my relationship. And I sat there, and at college, I was still trying to figure stuff out. Yes, I was raised by Christian parents, but I was in that point that we all have to be where their faith had not yet transformed into my faith yet. You understand that? Where I started thinking for myself, and it was what I believed, not what my parents believed. And she was very concise in saying, you know, my relationship is my relationship. I cannot get into heaven based on yours. And we do sometimes make a mistake as a body of Christ, both our little body and the big body, of being too attached to the group. Okay? Now don't hear me wrong. I love you people. Okay? Yes, there is an element of habit out of getting up on a Sunday morning, coming to church. I've been doing it way too long. But there have been times in my life where mom and dad weren't there college and oddly in seminary where I didn't have to go so I didn't. I struggled with my faith. I struggled with the role that the church, the little church, played in my faith. And it's taken me a while to realize, okay, yes, this is all wonderful, it's all good, but it's only as good as my relationship with God, my individual relationship with God. Moses got away with it. Abraham got away with it. David got away with it because they had put time and energy into their relationship with God. And God rewarded them, if you will, with putting up with some of their nonsense. You parents who have more than one child... Is your relationship the same with each child? They only have the one, and it's different depending on the day. Okay? Those of you who have multiple children, no, it's not the same because they're a different person than their sibling. Okay? And... You respond to them as the relationship dictates. And God is that way with us. He responds to us as the relationship dictates. And we as a church, we need each other as a group. We were talking about this in Sunday school last year. Or last year. Well, it was last year, technically. <laughs> last Sunday. Our church was going through what this time last year? Have you forgot already? Didn't we have about five memorial services over the course of four and a half, five, six months? Were any of us praying, God, enough, we don't want to look around the church and go, who's next? How have we ended this year, 2015? You've had a lot of surgeries. Yeah, I'm glad to see Dan Wade here. She's had a back surgery. Brad's here after having neck surgery. Bambi's here after having foot surgery. We're still waiting on Susan Busick's leg to get back. Is that right with the prayer chain? She had hand surgery. and John's had wrist surgery. Well, I'm glad it went from death to just really bad owies. Let's hope this year ends with, you know, just everybody has the sniffles or something smaller. Okay. We as a group, and again, we go, well, why do we care? Because we're a community that has a relationship with each other as individuals.
you know, I want Brad and Bambi and Diane to get better. I want John to get better. I'm fully healed. Not because I'm a Christian and it's a Christian thing to do, but they're friends of mine. Is it bad of me? I'd much rather hear about strangers on the prayer chain. It's almost too close when it's one of you. Because then, you know, I called my mom. How's it going? Well, we had to go to another memorial service this week, Mom. Well, goodness, son, that's like the third or fourth one. Yeah, I know. Then invariably she'll have to she'll say, Well, you know, so and so when you were a kid, yeah, well they died this week. I don't like hearing those. I hate to say it, I'd much rather hear about strangers. See, but God, to God, there is no stranger. He has a relationship with everyone, whether they believe or not. I don't know if I could be God who has a relationship with so many people whose backs are turned to him. And Moses in Deuteronomy is reminding you, each one of you need to focus on your relationship with God. Yes, we are a community of believers. Yes, we are a family of Christ. Yes, we are a a group with common goals and interests, and we want what's best for the church. And Even if it's something as silly as what the carpet looks like. But how are we going to react to each other one-on-one, individually? How are we going to encourage each other to have a better relationship with Christ this new year? That's one of our jobs spiritually is to lift each other up. And when we have those moments like David did in Psalm 109, where you just have the most ungodlike thoughts, But somehow you say, I've got to get it out or else it'll just sit in here and fester. I, I, I can't deal with it in here. I've got to get it out. So you find that friend that you trust and you just spew it. And they look at you and go, okay. Feel better now? Yes. Let's go get some coffee. Let's go to McDonald's. Let's go to a movie. Let's... Because sometimes that's what the relationship needs. Okay, you done? Yeah, fine, I'm going to. Remember, David's also the one that when he sinned with Bathsheba, the punishment wasn't on him, it was on the son. And he did his seven days of mourning while the child was still alive. And then when he heard the child was dead, it's then he got up, took a shower, ate some food, and he went to church. He went to worship. Because that's what his relationship with God demanded. I've been punished. I deserved it. Okay, I'm done. Let me try to fix it. That's when he wrote Psalm, what is it, 51? Restore to me the joy of my salvation. He realized he hasn't lost it, but he had lost the joy of his relationship with God. So I hope our resolution this new year is to fix whatever is broken in our relationship with God. 